So should MPs actually be paid more to stop them behaving in this grasping way in the first place? Well, joining me now is the podcast host and author of Immigrants Love Letter to the West, Constantine Kissing. Constantine, welcome back to the programme. Um, Great to do your podcast, by the way. I've had a great reaction to it. Good, bad and ugly, <laughs> uh, which is the perfect reaction to any interview. Thanks right? for coming on. Um, this, when you watched all this in its, in its full gory details, it was so gruesome to watch. And it was the usual suspects. Hancock, Quarting. Didn't surprise me at all that Quarting you know, had very little grasp on reality of money. Uh, I love Hancock... the way you said yearly rate. Like, he's upselling you already. I, I did enjoy that. What I mean, your takeaway from that was that you have a belief that MP should be paid a lot more money. I have to say, I sort of share that view. Mm. I sort of think if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, right? And we're paying peanuts and getting people who just seem to me to be extremely low caliber politicians. Mm -hmm. And we need to somehow raise that bar. Would money alone do that, do you think? Well, it, the, the headline, pay them more, is what people took away from what I've been saying about this. My view is, yes, you pay them more, but you then also ban them from... You say they're allowed to have second jobs. They're allowed to have third jobs and fourth jobs and fifth jobs. So as long as the incentive structure is there, they're not getting paid a huge amount for the job that they're doing. Obviously, compared to the ordinary person, they're, they're being paid a fair chunk of money, but compared to other people operating at the top of society. I mean, if you wanted your favourite football club mm. to be run by someone who's very good, you'd happily pay them three, four million right. quid a year, right? And in Singapore, they pay, apparently, their, their yeah. politicians a lot of money, yeah. millions of dollars. So they take a view that you then attract the best talent. Your country benefits. It's actually a small price to pay. You get what you pay for. And I think with them, you have to ban the second, third and fourth jobs and so on. And you have to make sure that they put their uh, stocks and shares in the trust where they don't get uh, benefits from companies being traded in a certain way and whatever. But the, the bottom line is, Piers, you get what you pay for. And we well, it's have interesting. To, I mean, on that point... We have to get better people into Parliament. Right, so do. Singapore, they get £672,000 a year for yeah. an average member of Parliament in Singapore. Spain is only 49,000. Germany, 108,000. United States senators, 142,000 pounds. And France, just under 80,000 pounds. So I guess by comparison to most of Europe, ours get... The, you know, in the kind of middle range of that. But Singapore, dramatically different. And they believe over there they really does attract a better calibre. Uh, and that makes perfect sense to me. I just, I just think the pro one of the biggest problems with our politics, peers, is people think about tribe rather than results. Mm. And if you're tribal about this, you go, well, you know, Hancock and Quarting, of course. But actually, cast your mind back to the Blair government. It's not like it, they were all squeaky clean either. We have a system in which the incentive structure encourages politicians not to take money from us and to serve us. We have a political system where they take money from, some, in this case, some pretend Korean company. And who are they then serving? Well, exactly. I completely agree. I want to switch to another story which I thought would, uh, would probably get your interest. Mm. The Guardian newspaper owners, the Guardian being the most woke newspaper on planet Earth, absolutely beyond reproach. And they've led cancel culture, they've led wokery, they are purer than pure, whiter than white, in all things ethical. And they've had an unfortunate moment today because the Scott Trust that owns The Guardian has had to issue a public apology because it turns out the origins of the wealth used to establish The Guardian came from slavery. A review found the paper's founder, John Edward Taylor, had links to slavery through partnerships in cotton manufacturing. Obviously, the Guardian reaction is to fall on its knees, beg for mercy, announce all sorts of initiatives to prove they're not a bunch of, of uh, racists and so on. You'd expect that from The Guardian. But a comical irony mm. that the paper that's driven probably more than any publication in the world, this kind of woke mentality and been hectoring everybody else about their own shortcomings gets caught like this. This is a very good example of this whole thing more generally where most of these people who claim to be kind and compassionate, they behave in the most awful ways towards the people that they disagree with. Mm. And I think this is where, you know, I'm not... Uh, I don't spend a lot of time reading The Guardian. I'm not going to cancel it's The Guardian. It's actually bad for my mental health, <laughs> so I don't. But what I, I do think is, you know, everyone lives in a glass house to some mm. extent, and I think what I take out of this is we should all throw, stop throwing rocks around because I, I genuinely think that if you dig down long enough, every one of us has some ancestor who did something wrong. Mm. And the less we, we focus on things that happened 300 years ago, and the more we come together and try to solve the problems of today, I think the better off we're going to be. I just think this self-flagellation mm. over historical stuff, which current people had nothing to do with, yeah. what's the point? You know, it's like this thing in San Francisco where they're looking to pay millions and millions of dollars 
to every black person who lives in San Francisco as some kind of reparations for what previous generations did hundreds of years ago. I don't understand how that helps anybody. No, it doesn't. And as you know, I talk about it in the book mm. uh, and, and the issue of slavery more broadly. I just think we've got stuck in the past in a way that's completely unhelpful. Many of the conversations we have now in the West are about looking inward and going, why are we so bad? Why are we so wrong? And the case I make in an immigrant's love letter to the West is we live in one of the most open, tolerant, pro mm. genuinely progressive societies in the history of humanity. Yes. Let's appreciate that. Let's at least notice that, for God's sake. When do we stop celebrating our country, <laughs> right? And I feel the same way about America. A new poll came out today saying the majority of Americans, the first time I can remember, now no longer think it's the best country in the world. Americans always used to do that, right? Mm. Now they don't. There's a kind of... Again, self-flagellation about the state of the countries now, whereas America and, and Britain, in many ways, are two of the great countries of the world today. Unquestionably. Right? And uh, to me, it's mind-boggling that we're in this position. But beyond being sort of frustrated and going, oh, these pink-haired idiots are running around, ruin mm. whatever, to me, this is a real threat, Piers. Because if we in the West do not have the strength of our convictions, we do not have the courage to stand up and say... You know, our history is the same mm. as the history of every other society. We've done good and bad. But on balance, we're good. We're good people. We are people who are doing good in the world. Um, then, then other people will come and take over. You know, the best, works. the best people ever in the history of this planet have all been flawed geniuses. Right. I'm, I'm talking to one and you're facing one. Two prime examples. Constantly, great to see you. Uh, Immigrants Love That as the West. Really excellent book. Making the points you just made. Good to see you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Piers.